Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for coming uh, to this very late in the day event. You're probably all struggling with jet lag and uh, lots of, of digital rights um, topics, but we're very grateful that you're joining us for Article 19's panel um, on the balancing act that is advocacy with big tech in restrictive regimes. Uh, my name is Sarah Clark, and I'm the director of Article 19 for Europe and Central Asia. And we're delighted to have um, some really brilliant uh, stakeholders from um, from across the the from from uh, from all multi stakeholders uh, stakeholders um, to discuss emerging and pressing issues um, relating to to how to conduct advocacy. Uh, with big tech in, in authoritarian and restrictive regimes. Um, to my right, we have Chatay Pekurur, the Human Rights Policy Manager for the Middle East, Africa and Turkey for Meta. Um, online, we have Trin Hu Long, who is the co-founder and co-director of Legal Initiatives for Vietnam. To my right is, is Swai Ergin, who's the Program Officer for Article 19, Europe and Central Asia. And then we have Elonai Hickok, the Managing Director of the Global Network Initiative. As you know, the digital rights landscape is transforming into a battlefield due to the escalation of government-imposed restrictions. Authoritarian regimes are exerting immense control over online content, pushing big tech companies into a dilemma whether to comply with restrictive orders or face potential throttling and severe sanctions. And this becomes particularly problematic in contexts where online platforms serve as the only medium for dissent. Civil society's push for big tech companies to resist undue government pressure can lead to unintended consequences, such as throttling or even total inaccessibility of these platforms, jeopardizing users and communities that civil society seeks to protect. The gravity and complexity of this issue has been underlined by recent cases, which this panel will explore. The pre-election context in Turkey saw big tech platforms such as Twitter, Meta and YouTube caught in a predicament as the government mandated content uh, blocking and faced with the threat of bandwidth throttling on the eve of an election in Turkey um, and in Vietnam, these platforms opted for content uh, censorship. Um, and in Vietnam, Facebook succumbed to the content blocking in Vietnam after being throttled. So today's panel is going to focus on fostering actionable solutions and strategies to advocate for digital rights amidst hostile environments. And just to give you um, a little breakdown on, on how today will work, um, it is uh, a workshop uh, with an interactive element. So we're going to begin with an introduction and setting the stage. So we'll have interventions um, from our panelists. We are then gonna have a, a breakout session and we're gonna move around the room a little bit. So we'll have um, two breakout groups um, to discuss what you've been facing um, yourselves in terms of advocating for digital rights in restrictive regimes. Um, and then we'll have uh, reporting back um, and some final uh, comments uh, from, from the panel. Um, so to begin, um, we're, we're going to start with, with Swai. Um, so Swai, uh, could you elaborate on how the recent changes in Turkey's internet legislation are influencing both civil society and international tech companies? And what is the, the importance of these changes globally? Thank you, thank you, Sarah. And thank you all for joining us in this critical discussion. Uh, it's wonderful to see everyone here today and I look forward to a fruitful discussion. Uh, as Sarah stated, our workshop today is inspired by the recent censorship on social media platforms on the eve of the elections in Turkey, which exemplifies how big tech can be cornered into censorship by undue government requests that are incompatible with international human rights law. And far from being just another country wrestling with these issues, Turkey serves as a cautionary tale. Its legislative landscape showcases how laws can be weaponized against free speech, influencing not just Turkey, but setting an alarming precedent for other nations as well. I won't delve into all the legal complexities, 
that would take us an hour alone, but to provide context, uh, internet legislation in Turkey has gradually bec become more restrictive over years. And this can be seen as a response to the increasing importance of online platforms in the country because the mainstream media become more and more uh, under the control of pro-government uh, groups, which is at 90% now. And online, uh, so that online platforms have become the main source for, of news and an essential tool for independent journalism. Since two, uh, October 2022, spreading disinformation is an offense that carries up to three years imprison imprisonment uh, sentence in Turkey. And while the operating environment for platforms was already hostile before these uh, last amendments in uh, 2022, now the companies face heavy fines, including up to 90% bandwidth throttling and advertising bans for non-compliance with a single content takedown order. Yes, that's right. Even one instance uh, of non-compliance can lead up to 90% of bandwidth throttling in addition to advertisement bans. Companies are also required to provide user data upon request of uh, prosecutors and courts in relation to certain crimes. And if they refuse to do so, even in one uh, single case, platforms again can be throttled. And this is just a glimpse of the strict uh, sanctioning regime that can place platforms under significant formal and informal uh, pressure. And the threats of throttling are not empty ones. It is that ch chilling reality that can and has impeded both free expression and access to vital information in Turkey. Twitter, for example, was throttled during the aftermath of uh, devastating earthquakes earthquakes in uh, February, compromising uh, rescue efforts as people were mainly using this platform to coordinate rescue operations, as well as asking for help and sometimes even under the rubble. Uh, yet, hours after meeting with the government and also after a huge ba public backlash, restrictions were lifted. This, so these th threats are real, immediate and uh, carry dire consequences. And uh, so laws have been tightened, fines have been raised, and threats of throttling are real ones. And it's, it's, it's a chilling reality that can and has um, become reality in uh, Turkey. Be so before the uh, 14 May elections, YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook uh, restricted access to certain content to avoid being blocked on the day of the election. This was stated both by Twitter and Meta in their public statements. And the, so the dilemma here is stark. Should platforms comply and censor or risk being accessible, inaccessible uh, in, on such an important day? It's a terrible choice to have to make and raises the question of how to counterbalance such government, governmental overreach. Thanks, Why. And, and what strategies do you recommend um, for fighting back and um, for, for how civil society can balance advocacy? Um, so some suggestions for big tech uh, would be they, they need to develop contingency plans to protect access during sensitive periods like elections. Uh, second, uh, as we always called on uh, Big Tech to conduct human rights due diligence before taking any compliance steps, as well as operating in restrictive environments. Uh, third, uh, Big Tech needs to uh, engage actively with local NGOs and invite them for consultations. Fourth, um, they need to coordinate with, it, with each other. And finally, the value of transparency cannot be overstated. It can be a game changer in, in settings where informal pressures and secret communications are the norm. This means full disclosure of government requests and compliance actions. For example, Twitter's publication of government communications on the censorship ahead of the election well, elections was a step in the right direction. And for civil society, we need to continue to advocate and coordinate on digital rights issues because pressure can really in influence platform decisions and we, uh, civil society also, even in restrictive regimes, try to um, um, coordinate or communicate with the governments as well to, to, to communicate their asks or to make the human rights case. And what else can be done? 
public literacy on digital rights, bringing international attention to these critical issues. Forum like this one offer the opportunity to align strategies and coordinate our efforts. But even if all these strategies are implemented, can we say that uh, access to internet will be ensured and everyone will enjoy their right to free expression online? No, because these are uh, band-aids to symptoms and we can brainstorm countless solutions for the symptoms, but any progress we make will be temporary and incomplete. To genuinely solve the issue, uh, we need to address the core issues of lack, lack of rule of law, lack of independent judiciary, a stifled civil society and absent international accountability, which allow authoritarian states to act with impunity. So for states, uh, your diplomatic efforts must extend to digital rights, ensuring governments are held to international human rights standards. Digital rights uh, should be proviso in trade agreements. And last but not least, financial and logistical support for NGOs can go a long way in creating a robust civil society capable of uh, fighting against repression. Thank you. Sorry. Turning then to Chatai. So, Chatai, you're the human rights policy manager for the Middle East, Africa, and Turkey for META. So, in light of SWI's um, insights, can you share META's pr perspective and experiences in Turkey in particular? Uh, during the recent election time? Of course, uh, I'll try my best. Uh, first of all, I would like to start by thanking you uh, for inviting me to this panel. Like, uh, genuinely, I'm so happy to be here and uh, contributing to this very valuable debate that you are leading. Uh, and also, uh, so I thank you so much for like putting everything uh, th out there so bluntly. Uh, I cannot agree more, uh, literally, everything that you said, including like how international uh, fora should uh, react to this challenge. Uh, I want to uh, start by explaining like how in Meta we are approaching uh, in instances when we need to uh, try to find a balance between government requests uh, and also human rights. Uh, so we have our human rights uh, um, corporate policy uh, since March 2021, uh, which uh, clearly states uh, that as META, uh, we are bound by uh, United Nations guiding principles, and also it talks about our JNI commitments, which goes way beyond 2021, uh, but it still uh, uh, underlines it. And I think that plays an important role uh, in specific instance, uh, because uh, I'm sure like many people do know but like I want to repeat it, like GNI principles are very clear. Uh, it says that like ICT companies uh, like us, uh, we should comply with all applicable laws. It includes local law as well, uh, but also respect internationally recognized human rights. Uh, and if they contradict with each other, uh, and in many cases uh, we do see it unfortunately, uh, we should avoid, minimize, or otherwise address the adverse impact of government demands, laws of regulation, or, and seek ways to honor princip principles of internationally recognized human rights to the greatest extent possible. Um, I think, uh, like, even though like it's the, like a one big statement, uh, you see where it's directing uh, the companies. Um, and uh, as part of our corporate human rights policy, we started to publish human rights reports, uh, like uh, we just uh, published the second one for the year 2022. Uh, it talks about uh, the um, comprehensive human rights uh, salient risk assessment that we made uh, in, again, 2022. Uh, in that one, uh, if you uh, like uh, dig into it, uh, you can see it only talks uh, about uh, it only talks in two instances where uh, we are faced with uh, government's direct demands, which may uh, impact human rights of our users. The first one is the overbroad government requests on take time requests. Uh, and the second one is uh, over overbroad or unnecessary government demands for user data. Uh, the first one is very obvious, like it, is, it relates to uh, freedom of opinion and expression. Uh, the second one, uh, it's about like right to privacy, uh, but uh, when we think about the way that governments are uh, using uh, this data, actually it's again related to the voice. 
of our users because like they want to get user data if it's an overbroad or, or unnecessary demand uh, in some cases to silence uh, political opposition uh, so I think both are connected uh, with uh, the things that you mentioned for Turkey um, and uh, I want to uh, give you a, like a little like, like some brief information about how we are dealing when we receive these requests from government, especially uh, take line requests. Uh, you may find more detailed information in our uh, transparency center. Uh, you can click on any country at the bottom. Uh, there is more information about like how we are approaching this globally. Uh, on that page, there are lots of like sections. There is a section called the life cycle of uh, TDRs, which has all the information about it with all the details, which I won't be able to get in today. Uh, but uh, very briefly, uh, when we receive a request from a government uh, or uh, an institution uh, that has powers uh, to make this type of a request, we first review it with our community standards. If the content is uh, against our community standards, we remove it. If not, we continue in the process. Uh, we conduct a legal uh, review. Uh, that legal review, uh, it's independent, like we are doing a legal review independently. Uh, it's not only about the procedural uh, uh, legality of the decision, but it also uh, make, makes an assessment uh, if it's uh, legal in the uh, local law, uh, local legislation. Uh, at this stage, we may reject the request, actually. Uh, but if we haven't rejected, then we move to the human rights uh, assessment that we conduct. And there, we have another legality uh, assessment, which uh, also considers international human rights standards. Uh, then, like, we check legitimacy, necessity, proportionality. These are all the things like that are part of the international uh, human rights uh, standards when we think about freedom of opinion and expression. But we also need to consider external risks. And I think that's the most important part in this debate. Because like, when we talk about external risks, uh, it may include uh, several things, uh, including our salient human rights risks, but also risk of blocking, throttling of metas, uh, technologies, penalties that we may face, regulatory actions, criminal proceedings that we may face, our employees' uh, security uh, and safety, and also uh, offline harm uh, that may risk like uh, to our users. Uh, so we need to take all these things into consideration uh, before making a decision if we are going to comply or not. Uh, and as I explained, uh, like Turkish legislation, uh, it's there since 2007. Uh, and it has been amended several times. Uh, with each amendment, uh, both the scope of the legislation expanded. Uh, but also uh, the sanctions became more and more severe. And uh, at this stage where we are, uh, if companies uh, don't comply with one takedown request, uh, we may face 90% uh, blocking, uh, throttling, uh, just even like for one piece of content. Uh, that's the similar sanction goes for uh, not sharing user data. Uh, in the previous version, it was just a monetary fine uh, for the same uh, non-compliance action. Uh, so, uh, these uh, changes in the legislation, uh, as you may imagine, uh, affecting the way how we are calculating the external risks as well. Uh, that's a brief uh, like introduction that I can make, but I can be more specific about the Turkey issue if you want me to. Yes, we would love that, and we'd also love to know what you think are the opportunities for civil society to influence Meta's policies in authoritarian regimes. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I think, like, I'm looking to this, I'm going to call it an ecosystem. Maybe it's the wrong wording, I'm sorry. Uh, but, like, in the most basic structure that we are in, uh, there is the government, there is civil society, and in authoritarian regimes, most of the times, citizens have only uh, social media to express their uh, political opinions. Uh, in some, uh, obviously, like, it's not just so social media in many countries, but, like, in most of the most author authoritarian regimes, uh, it is. Uh, and uh, in that structure, uh, actually, uh, in my opinion, uh, companies are almost in an intermediary position between the government's uh, policies 
and uh, our users' fundamental rights. Like, that's what we are trying to intermediate, like, uh, trying to find a way in between there. Um, and, of course, in that structure, what civil society is doing is, you are the protectors of uh, these people's rights. Uh, I think there are many things that you can do uh, in this one. The most obvious one, I think, like, I'm really going to state the obvious, uh, you can work you know, towards making us more accountable. Uh, but also, uh, I think uh, there are many other ways. Uh, the second one I can mention is you can uh, work towards creating a more uh, strong public uh, opinion against uh, these actions of the government uh, to de delegitimize it. Uh, I think uh, the governments uh, also do think about uh, this uh, if their actions are legitimate in their country. Uh, so, like, they are also taking this in, into consideration. Um, and uh, is the third thing what I can uh, suggest, um, as you mentioned, uh, having uh, open dialogue with platforms, explaining what, what you are expecting from us, uh, what are your red lines uh, for us to understand, because, like, as we both mentioned, the regulatory framework is, like, getting stri stricter, and like we may not be able to do the same as we were because like this of the sanctions increasing external risk, but it's still so valuable for us to understand what is most important, what is the most important thing for civil society. Uh, and uh, my last suggestion is um, in this structure that I mentioned, I think we don't have to be face to face all the time. I think we can also be side to side. Uh, so like I think there's a room for like a lot more collaboration uh, in many different areas around this, of course. follow up but one final question there is is could you share an instance where meta has had to comply with or resist a government's request in turkey and what are the factors that you considered mm -hmm. of course i think i will uh, expand twice example uh, like uh, one day before the election uh, we received a take down request from uh, the turkish authorities uh, and uh, we complied with it. And we actually uh, made a live uh, transparency reporting on our action. Um, and in that one, like we explained like a uh, number of the content that we are complying uh, to uh, uh, Geoblock uh, and also mentioned like who posted it. And also we provided a brief explanation on what the content was about. It was about corruption allegations about the government. Uh, and uh, the reason that like we end up in this uh, situation, reasoning that I uh, can share with you, uh, we also mentioned it in our uh, transparency reporting. Um, in the law, like if we don't comply within four hours, uh, they may throttle us, as I mentioned, 90%. Uh, but like this is the risk on the paper. Uh, this is not how we evaluate the risk. We actually try to evaluate the real risk if it's really going to happen or not. And the background story here, uh, for Turkish elections, uh, we were engaging with civil society for a long time. And uh, because of what happened during the earthquake time, uh, the throttling of t Twitter and uh, amendments to the, new, uh, to the internet law, uh, there were concerns around uh, throttling for during the election periods. And we were also hearing from civil society that our products are most valuable uh, on the election day specifically for the civil society who are working on election integrity related issues. Uh, so like we understood that it was a top priority. This content, even though it's related to uh, like um, democratic institutions, uh, it was not directly related to uh, civil society's efforts on election integrity. Uh, and it was one day before uh, the election, as I mentioned. So we thought uh, what is more important there. And like uh, we concluded that the risk is real of throttling risk because it happened very recently. And uh, we also thought like uh, the civil society will need us next day. Uh, but because the uh, topic was in, like had a 
had an importance uh, for uh, democratic inst institutions, as I mentioned. We did choose the way of like doing a live transparency reporting rather than waiting for uh, our uh, biannual uh, reporting. Fascinating, and I remember those those days really well. And I remember the the feeling the day before the election in Turkey that, you know, if we had a, a contested election result and a throttled um, web, we you know how how just how difficult um, that would have been. So um, I think we all we all remember how how fraught that time was. Um, we're now going to turn to Trin Hu Long, who's the co-founder and co-director of Legal Initiatives for Vietnam. And Trin um, is joining us online. Thank you. Um, may I ask, can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can hear you. Um, welcome. That's great. Welcome, and we're, we're delighted you can join us. Um, and also a big welcome um, to uh, everyone who's listening and watching online. Um, so in Vietnam, um, you have a different set of challenges to Turkey when it comes to internet freedom. So Long, I, I wonder, could you shed light on the current state of digital rights in Vietnam and how they compare to the broader Southeast Asian context? Yeah, um, th thank you very much for having me. Um, I have a presentation. May I share my screen for? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, great. Uh, let me... Providing my screen now. Just bear with me. Yeah. Super, yeah, we can see it now. Oh, great. Uh, uh, let me. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I regret I'm not able to be there with everyone. Um, but um, talking about big tech and human rights in Vietnam, um, uh, I have been following this issue for, for a long time. And if you read Freedom House, um, Freedom on the Net um, report, uh, I'm the author of the Vietnam chapter. This is a little bit of my background. Um, and uh, talk, about, talk about the Vietnam and the internet. Um, I would like to show you these two books. The one in on the left, is called the Generation F. And by F, um, the authors mean Facebook. And on the right, it is uh, a book called From Facebook Down to the Streets. So these two books have been published in 2011 and 2016 um, to talk about an entirely new um, social movement in Vietnam initiated on Facebook. And for for at least five years, from 2011 to 2016, Facebook and also Google played a very central role in social mobilization in Vietnam. And they were the very good allies and partners and friends of activists and dissidents and, uh, and the social movements in Vietnam. Um, but then 10 years later, up until 2023, this happened. So Facebook is now having a list of Vietnamese communist officials immune to criticism on their platform, meaning that we cannot criticize a lot of Vietnamese communist um, parties members on, on Facebook. And this was reviewed just a few months earlier by the Washington Post. So why, how does it um, come from being a friend to the movement to be in such a very problematic um, platform for, for all of us of all of us in Vietnam. Um, so to understand the internet freedom, um, uh, we need to put it in the political context that Vietnam is an authoritarian um, country. It is a closed society with one party ruling the country for um, 70 years, over 70 years already. And on all kinds of press freedom and, and freedom uh, uh, index and freedom on the next index, Vietnam is ranked somewhere in the bottom. And 
in terms of internet freedom. We are not free, only 22 out of 100. And on press freedom, I can, I can say that the most recent um, RSF report ranked Vietnam just above two countries, um, which are North Korea and China, right? Um, so the way the authoritarian regime works is to control the flow of information, right? The internet broke that um, control long time ago. And that was why we were able to have a lot of protest movements and social movements and election campaigns uh, over the past more than 10 years. And this worries the government. So um, also Vietnam is a big digital economy that a lot of big tech companies are trying to get in and trying to make a benefit, right? So we have, we have, we are a billion markets, um, and it's the, the most the fastest growing market in Southeast Asia. Um, a very big market like that is dominated by um, foreign services, Facebook, Google, Netflix, um, with the, some very rare exception of domestic services, such as Zalo. Um, and then we have, um, since uh, the internet has been such a threat, uh, the government have introduced a lot of um, legis pieces of legislation to control the internet. So we are not different from the, the, the global trends that governments have been trying to, um, uh, to make, uh, to, to have been following two strategies, um, criminalization, and data localization using the concepts of internet sovereignty and data sovereignty. So the Vietnamese government have been putting a lot of people in prison using the penal code. Um, and then uh, we want to shed light on the cybersecurity law in 2018, which for the first time um, uh, in, in, in the history of Vietnam that forced uh, foreign services to store user data locally uh, and uh, and they and foreign services have to open local office or branches in Vietnam um, and then the government has been aggressively introducing um, a lot of um, uh, laws and regulations to enforce um, the cyber security law the tendency is here is that the laws are all vague and broadly defined right so the government can um, interpret the law and regulations any way they want. And even the fact that, um, that there is absolutely no independent oversight in Vietnam, um, there's no independent court, um, no, the, the National Assembly, the Congress is not independent from the government to, to really um, to keep the government accountable. Um, the law and regulations can be interpreted um, uh, in, in any way. And then uh, another, another tendency is that uh, the law has been mainly targeting foreign services, such as Facebook and Google. Um, the reason is that, uh, is that these services have been dominating uh, the market of Vietnam, right? So they have the, the, the biggest um, influence. Domestic um, services have been very uh, weak, uh, so they have not been um, uh, able to to have uh, have a big market share. Also, domestic um, companies are absolutely under control of the government. So, the main targets of these law and regulations are Facebook and Google. Right? Um, we have uh, since 2016 or 2017 something something happened that the government put a lot of effort in forcing Facebook and Google to comply with their um, request and for a request for content removal and, um, and, and user data. And Facebook and Google have been complying with most of the government requests uh, with the, the, the rate up to um, 95%. And the government considered this uh, a very successful um, uh, strategy to um, to force foreign companies um, to obey with lo local law, um, and you can see that among 
95% of, of the cost from, from Vietnam approved by Google is about government criticism, right? Um, not only so, Netflix has been um, removing a, some, not a lot, but some um, dramas and movies from their platform um, under the pressure of the government. So uh, the government, how did they do that? Um, they target advertisers in Vietnam. So they go after the Vietnamese companies who advertise on, on Facebook and Google, and forcing these companies to review their, um, their, their uh, advertise, advertisements on, on, on Facebook and Google. And under this pressure, um, of course, Facebook and Google are losing um, revenue and they have to do something to, to, uh, to, uh, you know, for, for that, to, 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 to gain back their customers in Vietnam. And also, the government go after the hardware manufacturers, um, for example, Samsung or LG, and forcing them to remove the YouTube and Netflix buttons from the remote control, right? And um, dramatically, Facebook agreed to censor post from Vietnam after being um, being mostly blocked in Vietnam for four months back in 2020. This was, this was dramatic. Um, and since then, we have seen a lot more political contents in, on Facebook being removed uh, or real blocked. Right? And as I said, they have a list of Vietnamese uh, government officials um, immune from criticism. Right? Um, uh, and then, and then Facebook and Google, uh, they are having servers in Vietnam, but mostly public catch server. Um, and they have complied with some of Vietnamese government's requests for user data. Um, these companies have great tolerance of Vietnamese internet shows, mostly run by um, governments, such as the army, the police, and the propaganda departments of Vietnam. Um, and we have seen these three forces um, manipulating the internet environments in Vietnam in a massive scale. And they have been very successful in redirecting um, online conversations from sensitive issues over the past few years. Um, but we have some good, um, some successful cases of advocacy. So let me show you two cases. Um, when we uh, successful um, advocates for for um, some meaningful changes. So back in 2018, we had um, the new face, uh, cybersecurity law, and back then we petitioned Facebook and asking them if, if they store users' data in Vietnam or if they would comply with the content removal request from the Vietnamese government, um, and then. This happened uh, um, about, um, about a year later that Facebook and other tech companies actively lobbied the Vietnamese government to remove the data localization requirements from the cybersecurity law. And guess what? Last year, the government issued a decree um, effectively remove the hard requirement for storing data locally, um, meaning that foreign services are not required to, uh, to store data locally anymore. But if they don't comply with the government's request on data content removal and user data, they will be ordered to store data locally. So this came from a hard requirement uh, to a soft requirement now. Um, case number two, it was it was a very success um, investi uh, advocacy and investigation by a group of uh, friends of mine, uh, Mike Coy, activist Mike Coy, and uh, she's a singer as well, and a group of other advocates. So they investigated a, an inter uh, a government-funded um, cyber truth on, the, on Facebook uh, called E20, um, E47. And these groups um, targeting dissidents. And when the investigation got um, published on the intercept in December 2020, um, Facebook quickly um, took action and removed these accounts from their platform. So these are two very successful cases, and we think that we can find common ground, uh, common interest with technology companies, foreign technology companies, 
to, um, to make the internet fairer and better. And um, to, be, to be honest, I think that big tech companies, they don't need uh, more lectures or um, uh, advice that, that they have to, to be more um, um, friendly with all kinds of human rights standards. They all know these values. They all know the cost of upholding the human rights values in the face of authoritarian regimes around the world. They all know that uh, they can make a lot more money if they, if they comply with these uh, authoritarian and repressive laws and regulations. They know everything. So I think it's time for, for them to take actions. Um, it has been a long time that end users and, um, and civil societies sacrificing their digital rights um, and Facebook and Google and other uh, technology companies have been benefiting from that. It's time to, to, to change. And if these companies are serious about um, upholding human rights, they must do something different. They cannot, um, um, they cannot just remain the same and keep asking civil society organizations to have a dialogue with them. What's the point of having a dialogue without, um, without taking any meaningful action uh, eventually, right? So um, these are my recommendations for technology companies, and uh, I look forward to um, more um, questions and, and, and discussions from, uh, from the room. Thank you very much for, for your time. Um, there we are. Thank you, Long. That was, um, I think, particularly interesting to see just how many um, similarities there are between what's happening um, in reality in, 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 in Vietnam and, and in Turkey. And a lot of your uh, solutions and recommendations really mirror SWISE earlier in terms of what we're asking um, from the tech companies. So I'm going to ask you to stay with us um, as we continue on and we're um, we're going to go now to uh, Elonai Hickok, who's the Managing Director of the Global Network Initiative, um, of which Article 19 is a member, and we're, we're uh, delighted uh, to be working with you. Um, so Elonai, as the Managing Director of GNI, you have a bird's eye view of the global digital rights landscape. Are there common patterns or challenges that you're observing across countries when it comes to advocacy with big tech? There we go. <laughs> and say, you know, first there are multiple strategies for engaging with big tech. And we've heard some of them on the panel today. There's strategic litigation. Um, there are petitions. Um, there are investigations. There are rankings. There are organizations that help companies do human rights as impact assessments in specific contexts. Um, and maybe just to start out with a little bit of an explanation of GNI, um, we are a multi-stakeholder platform working towards responsible decision making in the ICT sector with a focus on how companies are responding to government mandates um, for removal of content and access to user information. Um, core to the work that we do is an accountability mechanism. Um, we bring together platforms, companies, civil society, academics, and investors, and all members have to commit to the GNI principles uh, with respect to freedom of expression and privacy, and our company members go through an assessment process um, that looks at how they are implementing uh, those principles uh, in their policies, in their processes. Um, and so this can take many different forms. An assessor comes in and they do an assessment report uh, that looks at these policies, processes, as well as case studies. So how are they actually implementing them in practice? And then this assessment report is discussed by our multi-stakeholder board. 
Um, and the measurement that is used is an improvement over time. Um, and I think that improvement over time standard is really important because we're in a really rapidly evolving digital ecosystem. And so at GNI, we are looking at how companies are adapting and adopting their processes and policies to meet the challenges. Um, many of the, you know, what we've, we've heard today. Um, and I think in, in addition to this accountability mechanism, um, which is not perfect, uh, but it is a multi-stakeholder accountability mechanism that we do try to implement, um, we also do work around policy, so consensus-based uh, policy advocacy, where we are responding to developments like in Turkey, like in Vietnam, like in Pakistan, and it's not just authoritarian regimes where we see concerning trends coming out, but also in democratic um, contexts, we see a number of concerning um, trends, such as, you know, requirements for, um, you know, tight timeframes for removal of content, uh, requiring that there are local offices, so personnel are on the ground, um, proactive monitoring requirements, data localization, um, a broad scope of companies being brought under the ambit of different different mandates and re licensing regimes. Um, and so all of these we respond to um, and through our policy advocacy. And then we also do a lot of learning, um, trying to understand really the difficulties uh, that go into these um, operating in these contexts. It's not simple, it's not a black and white, um, yes, you can push back immediately. Um, I think there's a lot of gray areas, and so we have conversations about how um, companies can navigate these spaces to protect human rights um, while they're operating in these jurisdictions. Thanks, Saloni. And, and have you seen any unique approaches to overcoming the challenges that previous panelists have discussed? And do you have any insights um, on how how advocates in different regions can learn from each other? I mean, so like, like I said, I think there are a number of different approaches that uh, different civil society organizations are taking. Um, from my perspective, I think there is a need to coordinate um, amongst civil society organizations, right, to make sure that our asks to companies are not so fragmented um, are asked to governments are not so fragmented that they're not impactful, um, while still maintaining our unique position in the ecosystem. Um, I think there is also a need for capacity building um, of civil society organizations to engage with tech companies. There is a very clear power dynamic uh, between civil society and tech companies. Um, often it is, you know, the tech companies that have the information, they have, obviously they're implementing and they're, they're working in these markets. Um, and so I think for civil society to navigate that and actually be impactful, um, there's a lot of capacity building that needs to happen. GNI has worked to develop different tools to help civil society engage um, with the tech sector. For example, we collaborated with BSR to develop a tool called um, Mapping Human Rights Due Diligence Across the Stack. And there it's taking an understanding of really for a rights respecting ecosystem, we need to be looking at human rights due diligence considerations across companies in the tech stack asking the right questions, but also understanding the role that different companies play, right? So a social media company, when you look at freedom of expression, you might be asking questions about um, their community guidelines. Um, are they in line with international human rights standards? Um, but if you're looking at a telecom company, you're gonna be really focusing on how, um, you know, their policies and processes are processes are in place to respond to government requests uh, for access to user data or network shutdowns. Um, if it's a cloud service provider, it's a very different question. Um, so I think it's really important to take an ecosystem approach um, to, to our understanding of advocacy efforts um, and the specific questions that we're asking of companies. Um, and then we've also developed a tool with GPD that tries to just provide basic guidance to civil societies to engage with tech companies, starting from understanding the company, 
Um, there's a lot of different arms within a company that might be important to engage with, like the legal department, like trust and safety, like policy. Sometimes policy is uh, known as the PR, <laughs> you know, the, the, the PR arm of, of a company. So how do you get past that? Um, then, you know, do you understand the legal environment that the company is operating in so you can understand what restraints they might be working with and then tailor your ask to that? Um, and then are you trying to come with a very specific constructive ask? Um, and then I would say just another thing that we try to do um, is we are collaborating with uh, Brainbox to run something called the Action Coalition for Meaningful Transparency, which is trying to help coordinate uh, this space around transparency. It brings together companies, civil society, academics, and just maps and coordinates the space. And, and so I think there's a lot of different ways to help coordinate um, civil society input and advocacy with companies, but also on these regulations that are coming out with restrictive um, provisions. Brilliant. Thank you. I'm going to just um, move to a slightly interactive uh, part of the event, uh, which was one of the, the asks from the organizers. Um, so I know you are all at the end of a long day, so we're going to just uh, just have a, a quick trial, yeah, of, of we're going to just break into two groups. No? Ah, uh, first. Sorry, we're going to start with some Q&As first. Does anyone have questions in the audience uh, before we break out uh, to the panel? Um, I know we have a couple of questions online. Yes. Um, could we get a mic? Yes, thanks very much. Yeah, come on up. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Oh, yeah, it's on. Hi, thank you so much for uh, your presentations. My question is about Meta specifically. So I think one of the main difficulties that civil society organizations have engaging with big tech companies is the people working there and how long they are present in the space. We have worked with through so many different layoffs inside of Meta where different groups and different um, uh, specific um, uh, specific people working with different human rights um, delegations, they work, they're not there anymore. Uh, and we saw that a lot with the recent Brazilian election. In 2022, Brazil went through elections. There was a team working on disinformation. Um, and by the time that the 8th of January attacks happened, they weren't there anymore. It was a different group of people. My question is also about context at a certain extent. Um, we've had multiple occasions as well where people working into certain issues and looking at specific problems, especially around content moderation, they weren't fluent in the language that they're working in and they lacked certain types of context as well. So as civil society organizations, as civil society members as well, how can we best engage? How can we best prove our value and add value as well and um, just engage in a better, uh, Inter, um, online ecosystem with big techs when there are those barriers and those barriers seem to not be a priority inside of the organizations as well. Thank you. Thanks, Chatai. That one's directly for you. It's just before Chatai answers, is there any, any other questions? There's one online. So we'll start with that one um, and then we'll go to you, Alexander, and we can, uh, we'll take another one online. So. Okay. Um. <coughs> For the first question uh, that you raised, uh, I think the only thing that I can say, uh, I can share my email uh, address after this with you, and like I will be happy to try to find the right person that you can engage with. Uh, in, I, I understand that the person that you were engaging with is not with us anymore after layoffs, uh, but I'm sure like uh, we can find uh, people uh, that uh, can be uh, that can continue the process that was there. Uh, and about the content moderation uh, question and like how uh, actually uh, you can engage in the most efficient way, uh, I would recommend you to uh, check our uh, trusted partner program if you have heard of it or if you haven't. Are you smiling? I'm not. <laughs> uh, okay. 
you are part of the Trusted Partner Program. Uh, then uh, clearly you are in the most efficient area uh, to be uh, uh, effective in that. Uh, uh, but uh, again, like uh, if there are any specific issues, like maybe we can discuss after this panel and I may try to uh, support, like in some cases there might be some needs of like additional training or like, uh, like having a direct conversation with the team that is responsible for the program uh, to uh, increase the engagement between civil society and us and like I would be happy to facilitate that. Thanks, Chatai. Uh, yeah, good evening, uh, Alexander Savnin uh, from Civil Society Russian Federation. Uh, so uh, maybe we are not so in Asian part, uh, but uh, situation with big platforms like Meta and Google went in Russia far away, far, far, far further than uh, you explained. Meta is now a terrorist organization, and Facebook completely blocked, uh, Instagram completely blocked. Uh, Twitter completely block or something like. Uh, so, but uh, civil society still exists uh, in Russian Federation. There's still people living, there's people still using Facebook. Uh, and even Facebook, uh, sorry, WhatsApp, uh, even being a part of terrorist in Russia meta, uh, shows signs of cooperation with government and something like. So my question may, may be more broad, uh, what, what we have to do if we fell in uh, much problematic situations that was explained in Turkish and Vietnamese example. Maybe not only to Meta, yeah. but for, for well, policy person. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, was the question what civil society should do in um, I mean, I think it would be important, for example, to engage in, in multi-stakeholder initiatives um, where you can share your experience um, and in, engage with companies to talk about, um, you know, what is happening on the ground. I think, um, for example, we have a, a working group on um, armed conflict and responsible company decision making in armed conflict times. Um, and there we try to discuss, uh, you know, w how can companies navigate um, uh, operating in times of crises in conflict zones um, and bringing that perspective uh, that, you know, Russian civil society might have, I think would be very valuable. So that may be one approach. Thanks, Thanks Eleni. Um, and a question now for Long online. Um, so Long, in the context of a, from, from a Global South perspective, um, which is increasingly moving towards the, the securitization of internet regulation and in the face of overbroad and vague legislation, um, su such as that in Vietnam, what does a policy of platform compliance look like um, and what would you, so this is also for you, chat like what considerations are taken into account in cases um, such as takedown orders? Well, I think you've, you've talked about that in, in the context of, of, of Turkey, but maybe long if you're still there. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think that's um, all the experts have um, laid out all kind of um, recommendations and um, uh, policies, recommendations for big tech comedy. I'm not in, in a good position to repeat these, all of these good um, recommendations. I, sh I just have one request for big tech comedies in terms of content removal. Um, please be um, more transparent in terms of what kind of um, requests you are receiving from, from authoritarian governments. Um, and um, publicize this request so the public can see. Um, Google has done a little bit by publicizing some requests from the Vietnamese government. And we know clearly that these requests are to take down um, criticism against the government and using all kind of big and broadly defined laws and regulations. Um, but then just a few the Vietnamese government have sent tens of thousands of requests to Facebook and Google only. 
So we need to know what it is. And we and users need a fair platform, a fair procedure to make an appeal. For now, platforms are playing safe. They don't want to be seen as committing um, uh, any illegal acts in Vietnam. So they have all kind of robots and, and, and AI playing very safe. And if they suspect anything, they will take down immediately until the users uh, make an appeal. But an appealing um, process takes a long time, right? And, and, and many appealing um, appeal um, requests are ignored by platforms. So we just, we just think that being more transparent is the answer to solve a lot of things. So, and I, I want to see all kind of government's requests from Vietnam. Um, and of course, there are le legitimate reasons to not publicize some of them, right? But most of them should be publicized. That's, that's my take. Thank you. We have another question in the room, if you'd like to um, come to the mic. And if you could say who your question's for, that would be really helpful. Sure. Uh, thank you very much. <coughs> My name is Vadim, and I'm also from uh, the Russian Federation Civil Society. You won't believe it. And uh, this is just, um, well, not, not really a question, but a uh, small clarification to what Alexander said. Well, uh, if we uh, go uh, one year back, uh, talking about the situation with uh, Meta, Facebook, and Instagram in Russia, uh, we should uh, uh, rem uh, recall when it started. It started uh, from the point when uh, Meta uh, allowed hate speech against Russians uh, on its platforms in Russia. And uh, that was uh, the reason for the uh, further actions of the, of the government. And, well, it is, it is understandable because uh, no one wants if uh, uh, any other person calls uh, those users of the, pla of the platform to, well, kill uh, other people. So, uh, the question of Alexander was, what uh, should civil society do? It's not a question to the civil society, it's a question to the platforms. What should platforms do? Mm -hmm. The platforms should uh, uh, follow the rules, the regulations and the laws of the country where they operate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have another question online, another one for you, Chat, I'm afraid. Um, and this time it's, it's about um, what, what do you do where one state weaponizes um, the internet against other states, um, where you have digital interference in, and incitement to violence and disinformation campaigns from abroad? Um, so what can be done in situations like that to avoid internet fragmentation? Okay, um, I will try to give my best answer, but like uh, I'll be frank, like I'm thinking these questions a little bit like out of the scope of this panel, because like in my view, like here we are focused on authoritarian governments, how we are managing their requests, but the question is talking about like how we are managing misinformation, disinformation, and it doesn't sound like they are talking uh, from the perspective that when they are done by the authoritarian governments. Uh, but uh, I did focus on, like I mentioned, like our uh, salient human rights risk. And I uh, did focus on two rights there, uh, freedom of opinion and expression and also right to privacy. But this is not the only two rights that we try to protect. The, the another one is like life, liberty and the security of person, uh, which uh, relates to these issues that's mentioned there. Uh, incitement of violence is something that we do uh, care deeply and take action immediately in many uh, different cases, uh, for example. Um, and we are doing it uh, from uh, the perspective of like we don't want to be responsible or like we don't want uh, these things happen in our platform uh, to be able to protect people's uh, life and security. Uh, and uh, when it comes to uh, these uh, disinformation operations that may come from abroad, uh, actually uh, when we talk about the authoritarian regime's context, uh, we also do see this type of disinformation uh, coordinated efforts we, from the country not only from abroad, 
uh, but also like uh, from some local uh, sources. And uh, we do publish uh, reports uh, on this one. Uh, again, uh, in this one quarterly actually, our trade intel report. Uh, and uh, you can see many instances uh, where in several, in several countries, governments are uh, behind in some uh, of these networks. Uh, and uh, regardless of the source, like if it's lo local or uh, coming from outside of the country, we share the details uh, of our findings. We have teams specifically working on uh, finding these networks uh, and then like uh, share our fund findings with the general public uh, to create some transparency on this. And obviously when they find the network, they take an action. Um, let me see like if I missed part of the question. Uh, when it comes to collaborating with uh, competent uh, authorities, uh, like I think uh, when I was uh, saying like over broad uh, demands of the governments, it's uh, I also like I was trying to imply if the demand is not over broad, we are complying to it. Uh, like when it's proportionate, uh, when it's within the uh, uh, lines of international human rights principles, uh, we do comply and. Uh, provide the user data or, or take down the content, geoblock the content. Uh, so in the cases like when uh, there is a, a crime uh, might be involved, uh, if the uh, local law uh, is requiring us to share the uh, user data, and if also like the request is aligned with international principles of human rights, uh, we do actually uh, provide. Uh, so uh, I think uh, we do it. Thank you. Thanks, Chatai. Um, so we're going to have a little bit of time at the end for questions, um, but we're going to have a, a, a quick um, breakout group if you uh, are still uh, have a little bit of energy left. So um, we're just going to divide the room in half. Um, so if people on this side um, could come up with, with our colleague Kivaljum here, um, we've just got two questions and people on this side We'll go down to the back with, with my colleague, Joanna, who's at the back. Um, so the questions are? We're just coming up now. Um, so what we, what we really want to hear about is what are the most pressing challenges um, that you've encountered or observed when advocating for digital rights in your region? Um, and how can, how can we fight back? So um, what international platforms or mechanisms can be leveraged to expose and challenge internet restrictions? So we're just gonna put these questions up here, but it's really, we want to hear from you guys what you're experiencing in your countries in relation to um, challenges that you've encountered when dealing with, with um, digital rights um, and in your advocacy. Um, and the second is um, how can tech companies best uh, fight back? Um, so how can you you leverage together with with tech companies? So if anyone um, who's who's interested to participate can just come up he on this side with with Kivaljum, and on that side at the back with with Joanna. Um, So the first question is really what what sort of challenges are you facing in advocating on digital rights when it comes to your work with tech companies? And then we're talking about strategies to fight back. So anyone on this side of the room, if you want to come up to the front, we've got a little group here with Kivaljum. And anyone on this side can go at the back with my colleague, Joanna. Joanna, if you just wave your hand. Just, thanks. So we're just going to take five minutes to talk about challenges that you're facing and, and how we can fight back.
sorry, we're just we're just trying to get the slide up on the but but yeah, guiding questions. Number one, challenges that you're facing um, in your advocacy for digital rights um, when it comes to your work with tech companies, and number two, any interesting solutions um, that you found. So Kivaljum and Kivaljum will present back and Joanna will present back. So so if you could just so one is challenges, challenges that you're facing.
So we're going to start to come back. Um, so two, two, three more minutes. Any burning points? Okay, guys, we're going to have our feedback session now. Thank you so much for, for bringing energy to this end of the day. So, Kivel Jim, just one minute. Yeah, great.
Great. Okay, so we're just going to have a little feedback and then any final questions. Um, so, Joanna and Kivaljim and online. Great. Super. Okay. Is she ready now? Okay, so we'll... Okay, guys, so we're going to have our first feedback from, from our colleague, Joanna. Thank you. Yeah, it works. Uh, th uh, so... Uh, okay, guys, just to... Just if we just... Quiet and down. We're thrilled you're all very engaged, but just let's have a little, little bit of. Um. So in our discussion, uh, uh, it turned out that uh, even if uh, we are from different regions, we have uh, similar um, challenges as uh, civil society. So uh, what was mentioned was, for example, that. Okay, guys, we need, we need, we really do need some some quiet. So we're just going to listen to Joanna. One example was that uh, negotiations uh, between social media platforms and governments are uh, mostly hidden, so there is no transparency uh, and uh, we don't know what, uh, what they are talking about. Uh, and what we need uh, is that no such hidden meetings uh, with governments uh, should take uh, place, that uh, uh, it all needs to be transparent and uh, civil society uh, needs to be informed about the results of such, uh, uh, of such uh, discussions. Um, uh, another uh, thing is that um, it happens that uh, country level um, people at uh, social media platforms, the, um, those who talk to uh, civil society, those who um, who have uh, contacts uh, often in a very repressive uh, uh, environment um, uh, with, uh, with civil society, with activists. Uh, they are often the same people who then engage with the government and uh, it uh, leads to concerns uh, from some of the activists about speaking freely with, um, with these um, mm, representatives of uh, social media platforms. Uh, and big tech companies in uh, more broadly, uh, because sometimes it happens that uh, uh, they are they seem to be even uh, close to to, uh, to 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 people from from the government. Um, and uh, uh, there are uh, issues with uh, engagement with uh, civil society that uh, are um, still uh, the same for uh, for for many years. so um, uh, when companies talk to uh, civil society, it's uh, rather ad hoc, it's uh, one-sided and it's extractive. Uh, and there is no transparency what these uh, tech companies do with uh, information they receive. Uh, and it can be really risky, especially in um, when we are talking about uh, repressive uh, regimes. Um, uh, we also talked about the uh, trusted uh, partner issue um, that uh, uh, there's been a report uh, published uh, about uh, talking to, as a result of talking to 24 trusted partners um, that shared their frustrations with, uh, with that process, uh, on, especially on response times um, or even no responses um, at all. Uh, so the conclusion of our discussion was that uh, the, these systems, this mechanism of engagement with civil society that are in place right now, they don't work the way we would like them to, uh, to be. Uh, and there is no collective process to make sure they are designed uh, properly. Um, and then uh, the next uh, question. Um, uh, we uh, we discussed uh, that th th there was one idea that uh, the discussion on uh, repressive regimes perhaps should be framed a bit uh, uh, differently, uh, like uh, that we are discussing the power of uh, big te tech companies because 
if we frame it as just limited to repressive regimes, then we risk uh, countries that are not repressive that they will be out of the uh, discussion and they will not engage uh, on, uh, on this discussion. Uh, and uh, in general, we need more active engagement from uh, tech companies to resolve uh, the issues on, on issues such as content moderation and lack of transparency, uh, because uh, there is also the feeling of uh, uh, civil society being a bit uh, tired of uh, lack of uh, uh, progress uh, over the years, that uh, there is a feeling that uh, we uh, keep having similar meetings, similar discussions, but uh, there is little progress uh, on the side of uh, tech companies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joanna. Um, we're just going to go online now to Kasha. If Kasha... Yes. Hello. Hello there. Good evening. Hello from Europe. Hello. <laughs> can you see me? Yes. Can you hear me? Hopefully. We can hear Perfect. you and see you. Okay, just, great. Just to like a short introduction, I'm Kasia Mirzejewska. I'm part of the team of European Central Asia Article 19 and helping today with online moderation. And we also had a very similar discussion online with participants who were joining remotely. So I can only refer to and make a nice segue through to what uh, Joanna already said, because during our conversation, it was uh, pronounced repeatedly that civil society uh, there is a big um, there, there there is a big responsibility and a big uh, gravity of uh, of the whole discussion on civil society, whereas a civil society has been advocating and um, creating and showing their uh, their main points of advocacy uh, a lot. So that's now there should be tech companies who really genuinely engage and address uh, what civil society has been. Uh, has been saying uh, this whole this whole time uh, because there was also mentioned that sometimes it feels like human rights policies established by uh, by tech companies uh, feel like a PR uh, tool and big tech should really do something take the reins uh, in this discussion and lead it because so uh, the civil society have been said it, have been saying enough and as as Joanna said before as a conclusion from. From one of the uh, from one of the discussions uh, on site, there has been this uh, this sense of uh, weariness and sense of frustration. Like how many more times civil society should have been repeating their cause that have been out there very transparently put, and the message is very very direct. And this is this has been conveyed for over a years. Whereas the progress on the on the side of of the companies of the private sector has has been little uh, has been little for uh, over this over this uh, last uh, years and just like one more thing maybe two more things that I I would add is the approach uh, approach on the on the business model so like when business model is heavily based and focused on data mining and uh, using data for the for the profit for the beneficiaries uh, also when it comes to the advertisement uh, that's that actually is keeps impeding uh, the human uh, human rights policies that has been uh, has been in place and has been established to be to be efficient so there is there is a need to maybe um, go maybe start to look in the other way and start going away uh, from this approach and think about a different business model that would ensure that the core human rights uh, needs and values and protection of of data is being one of the uh, one of the priorities uh, in for for the tech for the tech companies and there is also one. One more thing, uh, just uh, um, just a second. Ah, yeah, there was also one one more point uh, mentioned, uh, which also formulates sort of a question to to the representative of of Meta here. Um, the platforms could you fit coordinated uh, in a harmful smear campaign or or disinformation, and how to. Uh, react in such situations how taking down the posting because uh, what what has been mentioned also online is that there is one thing about content moderation and uh, shutting down co content from the like 
individuals, just individuals, internet users, but what should be and what are the policies in place and mechanism to, to ensure that uh, uh, more orchestrated and led by the government propaganda and spreading disinformation is being addressed uh, as well. And we're, we're asking here for any thoughts or feedback uh, from the platforms. So that's Super. that's to summarize our uh, discussion online. Thank you. Thank you, Kasia, and thanks to everyone who participated online um, for those really um, uh, cogent points. And we'll have Chato maybe respond on some of those. Um, and then just finally, Kivaljum uh, is just going to report back. Kivaljum's our program assistant uh, at Article 19 on this group here. Oh, hello. So um, in our group, the conversation was very, very interesting, actually. So the first point that came up was that um, the participants in our group have observed that platforms seem to respond much better uh, when requests are shown to them as, as a business um, opportunity. Um, for example, there was an example about Brazil. Um, there was a time when um, Twitter was blocked in Brazil and there was a big sports event happening um, because Twitter was blocked during this big sports event, Twitter actually lost a lot of money. And that is when they realized that they need to um, hire some Portuguese speakers. And that was the first time that they hired Portuguese speakers, is what one of our participants said. Another example was that um, we had a participant who works uh, for Tor. Um, they said Facebook used to hate Tor because they... Um, uh, <laughs> because their business model is based on watching um, what people do um, on their platforms. But then when Iran blocked Facebook and people were using Tor to access Facebook, um, Facebook started thinking better of Tor. Of Tor. So um, what was being said was um, our participants have found that instead of saying human rights and do this for human rights, um, we could actually say this is good for your business. You could make money out of this. So that is a way that they found that works well with the platforms. It's a bit sad, but I said what everyone said. No, no self-censorship. Um, the second issue that came up was um, uh, there was a participant in the group who um, used to work on reporting where bombings happened in Syria. So what they did, they would... Um, look at the videos on YouTube because people, when there are bombings in Syria, people record those bombings and then they put them on YouTube. And then that is really good evidence to know where, what, where there was a bombing, who did it, what happened. So what happens is um, the AI just removes these videos because it's violence. Um, but that is actually really good evidence that, in, that is being lost forever. So what our participants said was, um, well, of course they can remove it because their users, it's bad for their users, they should remove it, but can they keep it somewhere at least for a court case for when it's needed? So these were the two big issues that came up with our group. Thanks, Kivil Jim. Um, so I wonder if panelists would like to respond to any of the points that were raised. I know we're, we're well over time, but Chatai, Alone. Yeah. Um, instead of like responding to them one by one, uh, I actually want to share some uh, general uh, reflections on them. Um, none of the things that like we did here uh, in these comments are new to me. Um, and I think... And uh, that's my personal view. Um, the challenge that we try to discuss here, it is slightly different than uh, the general challenges that civil society may see in relation to platforms on content moderation, on uh, like business interests, uh, like how to better engage with civil society, definitely part of what we are trying to solve. Uh, but I think for specifically this one, uh, civil society uh, and platforms 
should uh, think together uh, rather than uh, saying like this is something that you need to deal this is something no you have to deal by yourself because I don't think that none of us have enough uh, power to show in uh, uh, kind of a meaningful change uh, when uh, we are faced with an uh, authoritarian uh, regime uh, and uh, the uh, problem is not that small. We do see lots of uh, big wave of actually uh, legislative developments, uh, which will uh, help these governments uh, to censor uh, content or which will force uh, platforms to share user data. Uh, they are most of the times uh, come uh, with the form of uh, cyber crime legislations, uh, sometimes targeting specific groups, LGBTQ groups, like we do see lots of legislations on that, sometimes more general. Uh, and um, I think uh, if we are uh, concerned about human rights risks, that may arise from these legislations. I think we should specifically focus on that topic and uh, specifically focus on how we can uh, resolve it together. Can, okay. Um, not as a response <laughs> to, to your contribution, but I actually wanted to uh, echo what uh, Katya said or reported back from the uh, online group. And uh, because I was, as we came up with this workshop idea after this, uh, uh, the, the censorship during the elections in Turkey, I was thinking as I was preparing for the workshop, but uh, what is the solution? And um, we don't need to actually reinvent the wheel. Um, all the, uh, as uh, it, it has been discussed in the groups as well, the, uh, I think the calls that the civil society have been uh, making for, for a while now, if these were addressed, I think at, at least uh, we, we wouldn't be um, dealing with such big challenges, maybe. We, I, I'm not sure because I, I still think the core of the issue is uh, the, um, the, the lack of rule of law and so on. But I agree, especially in, uh, I agree with you that in restrictive uh, regimes, uh, civil, so civil society and big tech m may work together, but it is still um, b because you are basically caught between a rock and hard place, uh, like in Turkey, for example, but it would uh, not impede, I think, civil society's um, obligation to also continue monitoring and uh, keeping you also accountable for, uh, not you, <laughs> but the big tech um, practices in, in these countries. Thanks, Why, um, Elena, any final remarks from you? Um, I mean, I just very quickly after listening to, um, oh, <laughs> I see the time is up, for, we're, we're over time. Um, the, the discussions from the breakout rooms, um, I would just come back to the point that I made earlier about the importance of coordination um, and finding ways I don't know if it's around coordinating on topic, on approach, on region, on the asks, on the best practices, but how can we as civil society start to be more coordinated? And I think it's important not just to be effective with our asks for um, companies and for regulators, but also just to stay on top of this space because it's evolving incredibly rapidly and I don't think it works for us to be working in silos and trying to you know, respond in an ad hoc manner. Thank you, Eleni. Um, and, and Long, I know that we've been told that our time is absolutely up. Oh, Kojo, would you? <laughs> did you? <laughs> Very brief. I'll, I'll try and We're keep it short. Cut off. Sorry, I'll try and keep it super brief. Hi, um, hi evening, everyone. My name is Kojo Bwachi. I'm the Vice President of Public Policy for Africa, the Middle East, and Turkey with Meta. Um, slightly surprised and a little bit disappointed by some of what I've heard, not because it might be deemed inaccurate, because I'm disappointed if uh, 
one thing I heard, your contact with us has suffered after layoffs. Like you don't have any people to speak to uh, when you turn around. Um, another thing is that we, sorry? How are you surprised by the I didn't say surprised, I said disappointed. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think if you, if you lay off 21,000 people, there's going to be issues, so it's not a surprise. But I am disappointed. Um, I'm also slightly disappointed by the consistent talk about Meta prioritizing money over everything else, which I think I've heard not only in this room, but in a number of other rooms. Part of my disappointment stems from the fact that it's not a uh, characteristic or action of a company that I recognize and I've worked here for seven years. And that's not to dispute that what you guys have said. I just wanted to ask if anyone knows a country in my region, uh, Amit, that uh, is, is blocked at the moment, where the internet is blocked. And I say this because I know no one from that country is in this room at this point in time. Does anyone know? No. In Uganda, the internet, or at least Meta, remains blocked because we divulged the, the fact that we disrupted the network run by the Ugandan, at least the digital office within the Ugandan government. That's a country where we'd made telling investments, not only in the provision of services, but also the, in the establishment of backbone open access infrastructure as well. It's in a country that remains, was, and remains extremely important to us. So where, as with all, as with all things, where we may have had some failings, um, I would like to think we want to work with you to correct those, but I do want to say that at least in my region I have responsibility for, uh, and I, I, I hope much of the world where Meta works, that these ideas that revenue uh, is a priority over all the human rights that we try to protect, I'd like to kind of uh, push back on slightly and also say that it's hard to push back on in this room. So I'm open to a conversation with anybody after this meeting or in continuation. Um, I also think that the fact that we have 20 people here, including our most senior public policy person, Nick Clegg, um, is uh, some evidence of our willingness to engage uh, and be beaten about a little bit. <laughs> Um, but just to learn from you guys as well. And this idea of continuing to work for us to improve and get better and to work with civil society is something that we hold very, very dear. So um, don't want to take too much time. I know I should be short, but open to a conversation to learn um, and hopefully improve and do better if we need to. So thanks so much. Thanks, Kujo. Um, Long, I don't know if you're still there, but if you have any final remarks before we finish, I know we're... Yeah, th thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I am, I'm uh, going very brief. Um, so I think that the civil society organizations from Vietnam, I am confident we will keep um, working and collaborating with the tech companies and, and other partners um, to address the, uh, all the, the fundamental issues we have talked about. Um, and we will keep finding common ground, common interests between civil society and private sector and work something out. But of our, also, we have done everything we could. We have said everything we have. Um, and it's time for big tech companies to really do something about it. And um, it, is your, it is your turn now. We have, we have sacrificed too much over the past 10, 15 years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Long. So um, just to quickly conclude, um, thanks to you, the audience, for staying um, so long and for engaging uh, so passionately and um, brilliantly in the discussion. Um, and a huge thanks to our panelists, to Chatai, to Swai, to Long and to Elenai, uh, to Kasha and to our colleagues online um, and to the wonderful uh, tech and support for going um, almost half an hour over. We really appreciate it. Have a great rest of your IGF and please come and talk to us about all the things we've started talking about today.